Hi everyone. Uh, so we're just waiting for India to join us from OCD Excellence. Every time I do a live, we have a technical issue. So um, hopefully this time it goes a bit better. Hi, OCD Oregon. Uh, yeah, so me in India today, we're going to just talk about sort of some cross-cutting topics for OCD treatment in the UK and treatment in Canada. And um, as India said in her post, we hope to see uh, a lot of similarities between the two, the two countries and the two uh, types of treatment. Okay, so India joined. I'm going to ask her to join. Ah, uh, okay. You look better. That's better. I'm not, my face isn't kind of squished. Great. Wonderful. Thanks. Hi again, Margot. So, um, over to you. We're going to talk today, everyone. Hi again, everyone. Thank you for joining. I can see them all joining, um, which is great. So, Margot, mm -hmm. let's start off with, um, why don't you say a little bit about what you do, and then we'll talk about what, what we do here, and then we'll speak about the differences in our, in our country approaches to OCD. Sure. Um, to be honest, though, like I, I run a support group in Ottawa, but I'm not actually a psychologist. Um, right. I've, I've read books and books. I feel like I have a degree on OCD <laughs> and I give a lot of good advice as support group, but that's my job is actually an economist. Um, that being said, so like, yeah, there are two things that I, I've done here in Ottawa. So we have the CBT clinic. Uh, which has a lot of people who specialize in exposure and response prevention um, and like OCD treatment in general. And I got treated there for yeah. a year. And then I also help run the support group with a bunch of volunteers. And we meet every Wednesday um, at seven o'clock for people in Ottawa. You can go to OCD Ottawa and get the info there. And we just kind of chat and like some people have OCD issues. Sometimes they just need somebody to listen and like a lot of times people aren't so familiar with ERP and so I'm able to like explain to them how to go about it and like how to build a hierarchy and give advice uh, by it from experience because I've been doing ERP for like almost two years. Yeah. Right. And are those support groups online for you, Margot? Or, or are they online now, right? They're online because they would be in the person. pandemic. Yeah. And and how much is the pandemic affecting Canada um, because it does have an impact on people's access to help. Uh, it's interesting because I was doing treatment in person when the pandemic started and then I started to do video calls so the CBT clinic does all of their treatment the same as usual but it's now on the on zoom and I found yeah. that there wasn't that much of a difference for me. Some people said it actually help them because they could do the exposures at home with their therapist watching so I think overall in a weird way people are having more access than maybe normal I know because I think it's changed mindsets hasn't it when you don't have a choice and you've got to adapt and work around the system we've all made it work and and sometimes it's easier for people to log in on zoom and do a session than have to get their clothes on get in the car, drive somewhere, or get transport and go and have a session. So in some ways, it's been more accessible, hasn't it? Yeah, because the other thing is there are people in our group that have contamination issues or all kinds of fears that make them not able to leave the house. And so like yeah. one, one of the volunteers, she, she had that. And she actually did treatment. And because of the treatment, she was able to leave the house. But she couldn't have left the house to get the treatment, you see? So right. it's actually really cool. That's really cool. Absolutely. It's it's great, um, in fact. So, Margot, um, to tell you a little bit about what we do, because we've spoken, you know, we've been sort of chatting online backwards and forwards, but we actually are a treatment centre, so we are all therapists, and we're all specialists in OCD. Um, and, and I think uh, one of our unique selling points is that we all have OCD. So all of the therapists, including myself, have personal experience of OCD and we, we manage it. So we feel as if we are like everybody else. But um, 
our level of specialism is, is, is quite high because not only are we trained in CBT and I'm actually trained in REBT, that's, um, that's my specialist uh, qualification. And, um, but we have our own training program. So we train people um, to be OCD specialists and we actually tend to favor anyone who works with us as, as therapists, we tend to favor those that already have OCD or they have, or they're a carer for someone with OCD. So we offer uh, online therapy, we offer sessions in person, not so much at the moment, and we offer intensive therapy, which are in kind of five day blocks. So we'll do a five day intensive, which is four hours a day plus homework, and we'll do that for five days, or if some clients need it, we'll do it for 10. So we've been working probably since 2003 now, like 17, 18 years in this format. Yeah, amazing. I'm pretty old. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, right. I seriously, I am. And, and and it's it's um it's been a journey, you know. And in the beginning, there was hardly anything. So we were um we were kind of in a niche on our own. And now, thankfully, there are a lot more people, which is great because we need more people to do this. And it's good that we're not on our own. So um, great. So now let's chat a little bit about. The difference is, so you've had a fair bit of experience and also you, you're an economist, so you probably have experience, anecdotal experience as well, of how the mental health system works. Um, but let's ch talk about how it's different for people to access uh, therapy in the UK and Canada. So what would someone do in Canada if they suspect they've got OCD? What would be their first step? Uh, well, it's the stuff that I took and what everybody does is you go to your family doctor and you say, I suspect I have, you know, a mental illness. In my case, I took a psychology class and I self-diagnosed myself. Wow. So I, said, I, I have OCD because I took this class. I have all the symptoms. Um, I need help. And the first family doctor I had said that OCD is fine. You can manage it, you know, just buck up. Uh, but in case, here's a psychologist. Didn't tell me what type of psychologist I needed. Um, yeah, it was awful. So then I just didn't do anything. And then a few years later, my OCD gets got worse because, well, as you know, like if you don't treat OCD, it actually right. inevitably gets worse, I think, like without exception, almost. Um, so then I went to my new family doctor who's very young. And he said, yes, like CBT. Uh, gave me a list of like this the right kind of care that I needed and then asked me like uh, if I was okay you know because he obviously was educated in OCD and so one thing we talk about in support group is often younger doctors or even skilled right. doctors are more educated in mental health than the older ones which yeah sometimes experience does isn't okay. everything and when was this when you went and had a fairly negative experience and someone said to you, listen, you've got OCD, go away and find yourself some help. I mean, when, when was that, Margot? So the negative experience, that was, I'd have to say, six or six years ago, six or seven. And then, so fairly recently, yeah. Yeah, no, quite recently. And I don't think this is uncommon because, like, even mental health professionals don't always know what OCD is or how to treat it or even how to identify what it is. So right. there have been people in our support group who say, I went to my therapist, uh, they clearly had OCD symptoms and the therapist like refused to like diagnose them. And so then the more recent positive experience was uh, like a year and a half ago when I actually got the proper help. And then because he gave me this, you know, like he was really told me which therapy I had to get I was able to go to the CBT clinic in Ottawa and then find a specialist. So when you go and see your family doctor, do they refer you or do you self-refer to OCD, or, you know, to the CBT clinic in Ottawa? So they, no, like they just give you a little slip. And because I have insurance, it basically covers a big part of the cost. So that's another right. thing. Um, mental health care, like it's like, getting a psychologist is not covered uh, publicly in Canada. So you have to pay for it yourself unless you have a good job with benefits, which luckily happens to be my case. So 80% right. of it was covered up until $2,000.
So after that half a year passed, I had to start paying out of pocket. So this goes to almost $200 an hour. So unless you're wow. really rich or you have really good benefits, you're not going to get uh, the proper treatment. Um, I have heard in support group that you can go on a wait list. This I'm not as, um, I don't know as much about, but you can get on a wait list to get free treatment for yeah. a certain number of sessions. But again, like I was able to get pretty immediate help because I was able to pay. Yeah. So, so for a family who's struggling or an individual who's struggling and doesn't have insurance through their employment, they would have to pay privately or always. Is that always the case generally? I would say almost always. Like I almost said, always. Uh, there are wait lists for ERP treatment. I'm not sure how they work, but it, it certainly seems like that isn't as common. Like in our support group, almost everybody has had to pay um, out of pocket or through insurance to get the proper treatment. So it's really hard. And what's your experience of the average price of a session in Canada? So, so let's give people an idea. I mean, you probably did a little bit of looking around and a little bit of research. What's the, What's kind of the spectrum for, for prices for, for an individual session? Because you're obviously, you've experienced sessions at $200 a session, which is pretty pricey. So what's the average? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I'm not, I don't know offhand, but I know it, it, it's at least like 175. I don't think you could get much below that. I know some therapists do a sliding scale. And also I have yeah. this student therapist so she was a little cheaper than 200 but you know I don't think you could get much lower than definitely not lower than a hundred dollars an hour I couldn't picture that no so, which is still very significant I, think, I mean that's a lot isn't it Margo well, yeah, that's a lot of money a lot of people don't get better after like three sessions that's right that's the reality Absolutely. It's a big investment. Actually, having worked in New York, so I worked in New York for um, eight years and, and worked over there with OCD. Uh, I think it's about the same. And, I, and New York City certainly would be expensive, but it's about $200 a session in New York. And, and they have a similar, some, some therapists do sliding scale, but not that many. And, and you have to pay on the day um, if you don't have health insurance. Um, so, and then again, the health insurance in the US is, is kind of capped. So you would have a number of, you'd have an allowance. Uh, so you'd only have a number of sessions because you would meet your allowance for that year and then you'd have to stop or you'd have to self-finance. That's exactly what happened with me. Halfway through the year, I capped out and then I had to start paying out of pocket. Yeah, it's, it's a massive investment. Here in the UK, we have, um, well, it's quite famous, we have the National Health Service. So the NHS is, is problematic. We, um, it's, it's well documented. It's, it's a huge point of political interest here and um, always affects our elections because um, it's been, certainly in terms of mental health care, very poorly managed and, and poorly resourced. So our first point of contact would be to go and see a, a person who suspects they have OCD would generally tend to go to their doctor as well. So at that point, we're similar to you. Um, the doctor they would normally see would be an NHS doctor, so that would be free, and uh, it's called a GP, a general practitioner. And I think in, in the States it's a primary care physician, um, PCP, probably the same there, right, in Canada? Um, well, they're just family doctors, so they don't it's know a whole yeah. lot, you know? It's just a... Yeah, they don't, yes, they're very much generalists. Yeah. So once a, um, there's a couple of routes for people to go. Once they've seen their GP here and the GP diagnoses OCD, they can then go on a wait list for their, we have local, every, it, all around the UK, it's divided into um, national health um, kind of sections and areas. There's an awful lot. And though, all those sections and areas have their own mental health care teams. And those teams can then, once you're referred to them by the GP, the team can refer you to a specialist, um, probably not in OCD, but certainly a specialist in CBT. So they'd be a general CBT, cognitive behavioral therapist. Um, and you'd be referred on and you get usually six sessions. However, having said that, 
you um someone who is referred to their to a cbt and it varies actually when you're under 18 you get um there's a youth and young adult mental health care team and then when you're over 18 you get, you then get referred to an adult mental health care services team and they there's a long wait list so not only would you be put on a wait list and it could be six to eight months before you actually see anyone and then you'd only get six sessions um you wouldn't get someone who's a specialist in ocd but you get a specialist in cbt you would get that so it's not a perfect uh system here and um i think a lot of people at the point where they go to their gp and the gp says i'll refer you to your local mental health care team they will tend to go down the private route so they will then self-refer which they can and sometimes with a doctor's letter to someone like us and so with that in mind we always keep try to keep our fees as low as we can i mean our session fees start at 45 pounds which in canadian dollars is probably about 60 dollars maybe something like that more than that i think it's almost 100 but is it good for us it's it's not too bad it, it translates to about 50 55 us dollars something like that yeah so so it's it's fairly low and then of course it goes up um, the more experienced our therapists are we we tend to but they're all good they're all specialists in ocd but but there are an awful lot of um and growing numbers of cbt practitioners here in the uk and that's one of the contrasts i was going to ask you about this in canada but when i worked in new york and people like myself that specialize in CBT um, uh, are quite rare. Uh, forget OCD for a second, just in CBT, because in New York, there's a lot of so psychodynamic, psychoanalytical work. That's the main bulk of the approaches and, and training that the therapists had in New York. And, and even though CBT was born in some ways in New York because of Albert Ellis, um, uh, and in the States with Aaron Beck for, for, for the other forms of CBT, it's still quite rare to get a really good, or it was when I left in 2014, a rare, C, it was rare to get a good CBT in, in the States. So how prevalent are CBT therapists in Canada? Uh, that's a good question. The thing is, um, I think Ottawa is very special because we have the CBT clinic and there's a lot of CBT right. therapists there. And it's like the capital and it's a small capital. So everybody like potentially could go. I mean, there's a wait list for that clinic, but um, generally like anybody could access one if, if they waited long enough. But it, talking in the support group, we have people from around Canada. And I, I have a very sneaking suspicion that this is not the case around Canada, especially not in a big city. I think that you'd have a lot of trouble accessing a CBT therapist. And a lot of people in support group go through talk therapy for several years before finding a CBT therapist. Um, so I don't think it's as common as it should be. You see, this is a problem, and I talk about this quite a lot. It's uh, that we, you know, if you go and see, if you have a physical ailment and you go and see a doctor, you will be referred to a specialist for whatever it is, a gastro an orthopedic surgeon, an ENT, you would expect an, to be referred on. But if you go and see your general practitioner here or your family doctor in Canada, you'll be referred to, to anyone who's, who covers a whole load. So in mental health care, the training and the qualification isn't condition specific, whereas when you specialize as a doctor for physical ailments, it will be condition specific or, or a, a certain area of the body but when you go and see a mental health care practitioner um over here you'll be referred to anyone so i've been calling um for a number of years i've been i've been asking for there to be um a concentration on uh training for mental health care practitioners that's condition specific because if you go and see someone that does eating disorders depression ocd borderline personality disorder ADHD. schizophrenia Seriously, we as OCD specialists, it takes all our time to be on top of the latest research, all the latest techniques to be involved in professional development. So I'm just thinking, is there a movement in Canada towards being more condition specific in mental health care? Hmm. That's a really good question. Uh, I can't actually answer it 
because I'm not in the field. Uh, I know oh. that um, the world seems to be trending more that way. Uh, but yeah, for Canada, I'm, it, to me, it seems the, the accounts that I follow on here are almost all in the UK or American. I don't yeah. see as many Canadian ones popping up. And so that leads me to believe that the answer would, would probably be no. No, I, I, yeah. I don't know for sure. <laughs> it's, but it's interesting, isn't it? Um, I, and um, even here, you know, what you mentioned earlier was fascinating. When you said that you think that younger doctors ha are more knowledgeable um, about yeah. OCD and they seem uh, more widely trained um, across the, 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 the spectrum of conditions. Even here, I get at least one or two psychiatrists as my clients. I'm treating one or two psychiatrists here. Um, so it goes to show, isn't it, that there must be some gap in Canada and certainly here in their, in mental health training, um, even at the, in the medical model, um, where you're going down, you know, there's this, there's a psychotherapy model and psychology model, then there's the medical model that, that psychiatrists and, and some clinical psychologists go down. And, and there, yeah, there does seem to be in the medical model, uh, uh, a, a lack of training um, and, and, and awareness. Uh, do, you, do you find that, Yeah, like, I, think, I think what you said is spot on. I think that now, like in the past maybe five or 10 years, there's much more mental health training for like just general doctors, which, is, which uh, other people in my support group have affirmed that younger doctors have actually been more helpful. And it's nothing bad about the older doctors. It's just like, Right. It just the field just evolves, and also mental health used to be really stigmatized not that long ago. Sure. And, sure. and there's been a lot of discoveries. Like I know that ERP isn't all that old, you know. No, so, no, it's not. I think like it, it's just like anything. If you don't stay up to date with the treatment, you're gonna not be able to treat the disorder correctly. Right, and that raises a, another question. Um, so what concentration of treatment do you think, or in your experience, not being a practitioner, what, of the, what percentage of your treatment was ERP and what was cognitive? Um, I've always been fascinated by this question. No, that's a really good question. And I had this discussion with my therapist because She was really cool. I really liked her. Um, she didn't like to put labels on anything, um, including Good. the fact that I had OCD. She refused to reassure me that I had OCD. So, like, I think that we, we definitely did a blend of ERP and CBT. She also, I could tell that she was using ACT, which I'd never heard about, but then I read about it, and then I realized she was using it on me. Um, so she, she used, like, a lot of tools to help me get better, Um, there could be like a whole session where I was having an issue with a family member and we would just talk about that and use CBT to talk about that. But when she could tell that I was getting into like obsession territory, then, you know, it was the notepad. Okay, we're going to draw out the cycle. Let's see, you know, how we can do ERP on this. So it's you have to be very flexible as an OCD therapist. Um, somebody's actually written, interesting, I think you can probably see this, they focus on most ERP with me and it's not as helpful, I need a comp, you see this is the, this is key and, and I love that your therapists use app because we use a lot, I mean we use probably 50% our rational emotive behavior therapy and then our other 50% is acceptance commitment therapy act and mindfulness. So we combine both and we actually uh, see a two kind of tier approach to managing OCD. Um, and, and I think that's right. I, I, I do think that a lot of mis, uh, misguided um, uh, information on the internet and in the press, and certainly in those people that actually plan protocols for treatment, are that ERP is the gold standard and that it, it's nice and it's, it's quite short and it's very effective if you can do it. And yeah, great. That's brilliant. I, and I don't disagree with that. But what I think doesn't happen here, and I was going to ask this about Canada, is that there is not enough concentration on the cognitive side. So the behavioral side, 
everyone seems to have nailed that unless we get to very subtle uh, um, subtypes and, 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 and symptom types in OCD like pure OCD where it's, it's quite hard to do the ERP we've learned that over time but what we find is that if, if, if a client doesn't do some really robust cognitive work, but they just do the ERP, the, the obsessions yes. come back as something else, and it's very short-lived, the recovery. So we really focus on that so that we've got long-term results, long-term management, long-term skills. And, and what's your experience of that, Margot? Oh, Absolutely. I feel like I had the behavior because I had to start doing ERP on my own because I was on a wait list and I had the behavior right. stuff down, you know, I stopped checking, I stopped doing rituals, but I had all of these irrational beliefs around, like I was also just beating myself up like constantly every time I didn't do an exposure properly. Um, and just like generally really hard on myself, had trouble accepting myself for who I was with the disorder and so, like, for example, this thing always, I always remember this. I said, like, I, you know, I drove and then I checked and I feel horrible. Like, this was so bad for treatment. And she's like, you have to, like, it's almost just like you have to be kind to yourself because you're not going to get, well, she didn't say this, but it's like, you're not going to get better if you keep, like, beating yourself up over a disorder you've had for 20 years and you're trying to fix in two months. And that kind right. of stuck with me. And she taught a lot about like acceptance and how like how to metaphors for acceptance um, and treat, how to treat myself better. And I think with like with that component is what she brought to me because ERP is really easy to do at home, actually, like if you make yourself a hierarchy, but you need somebody to help you say like, you're okay, like be nice to yourself. It sounds weird, but that's what the practice is for. <laughs> Totally. Compassion is a huge part of your treatment. And it's, um, it's, in, and it's part of the acceptance because, you know, accepting the anxiety, accepting the thoughts, accepting yourself, they all fit together and they mesh together. And without one, it's really hard for the others to have any positive impact upon you. Um, and someone's uh, actually written here, they put... Um, I have pure OCD. Does ERP not work as well? It, it does. I want to, uh, well, I hate that word reassurance. It's kind of illegal, isn't it, with OCD? But mm -hmm. I do want to assure them that there is an ERP for puro and it can be really effective. But the therapist really needs to know what they're doing. Um, ERP, uh, pure OCD takes a, a, a specialist approach. And um, that's why I think with therapists, it, it really separates the men from the boys because maybe therapists have learned about contamination or responsibility, but they haven't looked at the more subtle types of OCD, a lot of which can be what we call covert, mental and hidden. And those take a particular skill set as a therapist to tackle, depending, and that's why we always base the therapy on what we call their critical A's or triggers, because those are the same, whether they're internal or external compulsions. So I just want to reassure Elit Ouija, uh, you can do ERP for Puro, and um, you absolutely can tackle it that way, and it will be effective. Um, yeah. But um, back to you, Margot. Um, so where are you feeling with your OCD? And now that you've gone past the intensive stage of treatment, what are the support, what's the support network like in Canada, in, in Ottawa? How are people coming together? I mean, obviously, Instagram, you've used a great effect. But what else is there for you? Who's in your support network? And what can people rely on then? Um, well, I mean, for me... The life-saving thing is this OCD support group every Wednesday, and I I almost like center my week around it. There's almost nothing that I'll, you know, if somebody wants to hang out, I say not Wednesday, uh, because that is those people are like my lifeline. And then I have sort of a sub the the volunteers. I have a few of them that I keep, you know, that we chat. And then if one of us is having a hard time. I'll be like, okay, just talk it out. I'm not going to reassure you. Because, like, sometimes they need to talk it out with a, somebody who understands. Because if you start to talk to a family member, they'll start to reassure you. Right. So, cool. so we tend to, like, text each other if we're having a hard time. And, and I know how to approach them without um, making their OCD worse, but still like, giving them compassion. 
and to me that's been the biggest help and have there been any additional uh, services set up in Canada um, during COVID? Have there been any additional support services set up for people such as yourself in Canada when, when you've been isolating, isolating and isolated? What do you mean in terms of support services? Well, uh, in the UK, we've, we've had, um, there's, there's, well, for a start, the media has really kind of got on board with mental health. So there, is, there are a lot of TV ads on in the UK um, and certain numbers to ring and support lines that, that have become much, much more obvious since uh, last year, since lockdown. So, so here, yeah. I'm not sure what the follow-up's like. We haven't used any of those because we, we actually have our own. But I'd like to know whether that message about mental health during lockdown and, and the pandemic has been strong in Canada. Oh yeah, sorry, definitely. Like you can see uh, mental health ads on buses where there never were before. Uh, at work, they always now they. I mean, they've always had a support, but now like we get regular emails about like call this and you can get free support at work. Um, so there's been a huge shift in the mentality, just because I think everybody is starting to develop some kind of anxiety uh, around the pandemic and it may have triggered disorders uh, that were kind of just on the surface before. So for sure, Canada's trying. That's great. That's brilliant. I have worked in Canada with clients a few times and there wasn't that much there when I worked. I mean, it's obviously, I worked in Toronto a couple of times. Um, but having said that, that was a while ago and they weren't able to find care. So they actually had to speak to me. And I found that quite surprise, surprising. Oh, hi, Rodette. How are you? Um, so just as a, as a last point, I mean, we uh, definitely noticed that there's been a, a concentration of, of the media on mental health, which is great here. They really have got on board with that. And um, I don't know if you know about this, but uh, our kind of royal family, Prince William and uh, his wife, um, Kate Middleton, they, um, they, uh, Duchess of Cambridge, sorry, <laughs> her formal title, they're kind of on board with mental health. So they've really been pushing it, which is, uh, people I don't know whether they are, they find that really annoying or they get on board with it. But there's definitely been um, huge pushes. And I think they, they set up a couple of charities like It's Okay Not To Be Okay. Um, and they've done lots of interviews about that, about their own mental health and spoken about it. So there's also, you know, so there has definitely been a focus. We've had um, a couple of charities. We do have a couple of charities that specialise in OCD in the UK, um, OCD um, UK and OCD Action. Do you have any charities in Canada that focus on OCD? That's a really good question. And I am not aware of any. Um Wow. One thing to note is that on the IOCDF website, there's only one support group listed, and it's ours, which is wild because Canada is huge. It's vast, yeah. I we we kind of found it surprising, so I'm not aware of any. I could Google it, but it's weird. Like I tend to be pretty aware of these. Kinds yeah, of you things. know. Yeah, you would know. Yeah, I, I mean, so I truly think there's a huge lack of awareness and in Canada about OCD. So it's time for you to set one up, right, Margot? <laughs> that's like, that's kind of what I'm thinking. The more I've thought about it, the more I'm like, okay, let's try to, let's try to make this. Well, that's why we made free from OCD global as well. But I think we need to raise awareness that people know that they're struggling and that they can get better. And I think a lot of people that I talk to and in support group, they're like, are you better? And I say, well, you know, I'm never 100%, but I'm like 80%, 90% better. And they, they're like, how did you do that? How long did it take? And I think just like having hope um, is huge for people. So. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. So, so you, so from your personal experience, just in, in your kind of Instagram world, you're seeing a lot more UK and American uh, people in the OCD community online than you are in Canada and I think that's right I mean from my experience I think that's true I think a lot of accounts are UK based or or based in the states um, and, and and it's quite nice we're seeing quite a lot of Indian 
um, accounts and there's lots of people uh, messaging and reaching out to us from India where there was nothing in India to support people. So I think that's a, that's really good. That And you're, you're global now, right? So yep. you're focusing on, on, on the world. Yeah, well, I read, uh, so I listen to OCD stories every week and they interviewed somebody from Brazil and they said actually a huge problem is having the resources in enough languages. So if you can't get a therapist, at least you can get a book or Google it, but then it's, there's a barrier, a language barrier, which I never thought about, you know, yeah. he, he had lots of friends who were struggling with OCD who could only speak Portuguese, but couldn't find a therapist who spoke Portuguese because it's not a very well-known language. So there's that as well. There is. Um, I've worked in Portugal a, a few times and um, they have really struggled. They've got a couple in Lisbon and, and Porto. They've got a couple of clinics. But if you speak Portuguese, it's, it's quite difficult. We have, uh, oh, hi, everyone's saying hi from India. That's great. Hi from India. We uh, we are really welcome. Um, we we love to see that. Well, that's great, Margot. I really enjoyed this. I mean, we're not so dissimilar as countries, are we? I think the NHS probably makes us a little bit different, but I'm not sure it means that the access to healthcare is necessarily better. It is arguably free. Um, thank God for that. But I'm not sure the standard of treatment is, is, is always what people expect. I'm sure there are some fantastic NHS therapists, of course, but a lot of people don't want to do that waiting list. And so they kind of self refer for private healthcare, but um, that's probably the only difference is we do have some free care, healthcare, yeah, mental healthcare. Uh, and I, think, I do think there is free. I'm just not familiar. Um, like I said, a couple yeah. people in support group have spoken about it. But it doesn't, it sounds like it's only a few sessions and there's a very long wait list. So I think it's actually quite similar. And like I said, I yourself referred myself to a private clinic. Most people do that too. So yeah, it's, it seems very, very similar to me. It does. But mind you, if you don't know what the free system is and you're, you know, you're pretty astute and well researched and well read, um, it can't be that obvious. So it's, yeah. I don't think it is. No, sounds like it isn't. Um, well, this is great, Margot. We should do another one. Um, yeah. And thank everyone for joining us. Uh, they weren't, there weren't too many questions, were there? Um, no, I see one question at the bottom. Do you? What, you, what can you see? The, per the person said, does OCD affect emotions a lot? If yes, can your thoughts make you confused about those emotions? Well, I've, I mean, that goes without saying. I think, yes, OCD affects your emotions immensely. It hide well. It kind of goes on the back and uses. It's it's got a number of tools that it uses. OCD emotions is one of them to create this horrible OCD experience. Thoughts, emotions, and even physical feelings guilt. go up to make the package. Yeah, the, the guilt and anxiety are the big ones. And it, all it needs to get you to do OCD is to obsess and think and carry out the compulsion. So it uses those things as its tools to get you to respond. Um, but Margot's been training now not to respond for a, for a while, so she's doing really well. It's still hard, <laughs> but it's easier now. It is hard, Margot. It, it, it is. And, and, and both Margot and I can say I'm kind of, you know, 15 years, 17 years managing my OCD. I can tell it doesn't go, but I'm really good friends with it, and it's very, very manageable, and it doesn't affect me. It doesn't stop me doing anything. The longer I go in treatment, the more it becomes my friend and the less it becomes my enemy. It's not the putting. best friend I've ever had, but it's it, <laughs> it's trying to protect it's okay. me. I know what it's doing. It has my best interest at heart. It's just a little misguided. It's kind of yes. Yeah, it's, it's 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 what we call antisocial behavior. That's that's our OCD. Um, it's a little bit antisocial. So um, thanks everyone. Thanks for Adair. It was good to see you again. Um, and OCD diary. It was great. So we'll sign off there. But we'll do another one, Margot. For I hope. sure. We'll speak to you. For yeah. Me. Take care. Have a good Sunday. Hope it doesn't snow too hard. <laughs> Thanks, you too. Bye. Bye.